Hello, I'm Jill Morricone. We love Sabbath School Panel. We love spending this time with you. We are journeying through managing for the master till he comes. This entire quarter has been on stewardship and it's been a great practical study of the Word of God. This lesson is laying up treasure in heaven and I just wanna to introduce to you, they don't need any introduction, but I have my family with me on the panel. To my left, my sister Shelley Quinn. Oh, it's lovely to be here and my lesson is Mondays. Abram, the father of the faithful. Wonderful. To your left, Brother John Denzi. Good to have you here. It's a blessing to be here. I have something I have never really studied. Lots of bad decisions. Ooh, okay. Mm. Looking forward to that. To your left, Pastor John Lomagain. Mine is from deceiver to prince. We're talking about Jacob. What an amazing story. Amen. And last but not least, evangelist and singer in Israel, <laughs> Ryan Day, glad you're here. Amen. I love 3 being Sabbath School panel, and I have Thursday's lesson entitled Moses in Egypt. Amen. Before we go any further, we want to go to the Lord in prayer. Pastor John, would you pray for us? Sure. Loving Father in heaven, we are so blessed to be able to open the Word of God and find that we always enter into a book that's grander in thought and depth than we can ever be. Mm. But humble our minds as we walk through your word that you have seen so fit to reveal to us. And now today as we handle it, help us to do so as we handle a holy thing mm -hmm. and help us to communicate it, to bring glory and honor just to you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. 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 Thank you so much. This week's lesson, lesson number six, is laying up treasure in heaven. So I want to ask you, where is your heart? Is it enjoying the pleasures of sin for a season? Or is it suffering affliction with the people of God? Where is your heart? Is it invested in the temporary? Or is it invested in the eternal? You know, I read an article. It has something to do with where is your heart. Um, it came out a couple years ago. And it said, over the past 100 years, we have turned our luxuries into necessities. Did you know in the year 1900, less than 10% of families owned a stove or even had access to electricity? In 1915, less than 10% of families owned a car. In 1930, less than 10% of families owned a refrigerator or a washing machine. In 1945, less than 10% of families owned a clothes dryer or an air conditioner. In 1960, less than 10% of families owned a dishwasher or a color TV. In 1975, less than 10% of families owned a microwave. In 1990, less than 10% of families owned a cell phone or had access to the internet. Yet today, the article continues, 90% of the country of the United States of America has a stove, electricity, a fridge, a clothes washer, air conditioning, color TV, microwave, and a cell phone. Those devices, those things make our lives better for sure. They make us happier, but for some of us, they are never enough. Mm -hmm. We look this week at where is our heart, laying up treasure in heaven. Matthew 6, 19 through 21. We've read this several times in the study. Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. Lay up for yourselves treasure in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. The lesson brought this out. I love it. If you see how someone spends their money, you discover where their heart is. Mm -hmm. And you also discover where their heart soon will be. Because where we invest our time and where we invest our resources is where our heart is right now or will, where it will become in the future. This week, we study the radical lives of obedience of Old Testament men of faith in contrast to those who lived only for temporal pleasure. Our memory text is Mark 8, verses 36 and 37. Mark 8, 36, 37. For what does it profit a man if he gains the whole world, yet loses his own soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? On Sunday, I look at Noah. Noah found grace. You can turn with me to Genesis chapter 6. The lesson has this quote. Those who are seeking heavenly treasure are frequently called by God to make major life alterations here on earth. 
be prepared to face the same thing if need be. Now this is Jill's interpretation of those couple sentences and it goes like this. When you follow God, sometimes he will ask you for radical obedience. That's what I see in our lesson today. Noah, man of God, God called him to radical obedience. You see, Noah didn't seek for treasure on earth. He sought for the heavenly treasure. He walked in radical obedience. We see the divine judgment brought forth. We'll see this in Genesis chapter six for that universal flood. Yet we still see God's plan to fulfill his promise of salvation by renewing the covenant between the creator and his creation. There's an interesting chiastic structure. I like literary structures. And you know, the chiastic just literally means you have part A and then the second part mirrors the first part. And if you look at this entire story of the flood, you have the chiastic structure and it looks like this. It begins with Noah and his sons. Then we go to violence and God's creation. It continues, God's resolution to destroy, the command to enter the ark, the beginning of the flood, the rising flood waters, and at the very center point, God remembers Noah. Then we start back, the receding flood waters, the drying up of the earth, the command to leave the ark, God's resolution to preserve order, the covenant blessing and peace, and that it ends where it started with Noah and his three sons. We're in our story today. I'm gonna to give you seven takeaways from the story of Noah. Now it's a long and comprehensive story. We're only gonna look at verses five through 14, which is what our lesson has us looking at. We're in Genesis six. We pick it up in verse five. Then the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every intent of the heart, thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Now it's interesting to me when God sees, God acts. Sometimes it's as judge. Sometimes it's as savior. Takeaway number one, you can never hide from God. You know, God saw that the intent of their heart, it doesn't say God saw their actions were evil. God saw what the people did was evil. Now, of course their actions were evil, but God saw that the intent of their heart, the thoughts of their heart were only evil continually. Mm -hmm. We can never hide from God. Psalm 139 verse four, there is not a word on my tongue, but behold, O oh Lord, you know it all together. We can't hide our words from God. Right. We think we can hide. We think we can go in the corner. We can't, God hears everything. Continuing on, same Psalm 139 verses seven and eight. Where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I ascend to heaven, you're there. If I make my bed in hell, behold, you are there. You can never hide from God. Let's go to verse six. We're in Genesis six, verse six. And the Lord was sorry that he had made man on the earth mm -hmm. and he was grieved in his heart. Takeaway number two, our choices, they hurt God. Mm -hmm. Wow. You ever think I'll just do what I want? It doesn't hurt anybody else. It's not influencing anybody else. I just do what I want. Clearly no person is an island and we all have an influence on someone else. But I think many times we don't think about the words we speak, the decisions we make, the thoughts we have. They don't just impact our circle of influence. They can hurt God. The New Living Translation, this same verse, this Genesis 6, 6, says the Lord was sorry he had ever made them and put them on the earth. It broke his heart. It reminds me of a parent. Now, Greg and I don't have the pleasure of being parents, but I've watched parents and their hearts break with the choices that sometimes their children make. The Lord was hurt because his creation, he wanted them to follow him and serve him and become like him in character and reflect him to the world. And yet they broke his heart and how they were acting. Verse seven, Genesis six, seven. The Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast, creeping things and birds of the air. For I am sorry that I have made them. The word destroy in Hebrew literally means to wipe out as one wipes a slate clean. Now we don't, uh, takeaway number three is deliberate, intentional, cherished sin has consequences the people held on to their sin and there were many opportunities for repentance. 
many opportunities for God calling to their heart and them to have opportunity to say, yes, I want to follow you, but they hardened their hearts. We know that when God says, I'm sorry, it doesn't mean he's changing his mind or a change of heart. It's the humanity's response to him. You know, you think about the same sun, it melts ice, does it not? But yet it hardens clay. Now the difference isn't in the sun at all. The difference is in humanity and our response to God. Deliberate, intentional, cherished sin, it has consequences. Let's read verses 8 and 9, Genesis 6, 8 and 9. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. This is the genealogy of Noah. Noah was a just man, perfect in his generations. Noah walked with God. Takeaway number four, circumstances and environment do not control your destiny. You know, sometimes in psychological understanding, they say, oh, if you're raised in that environment, you're going to become like that. If you're surrounded by these type of people, you're going to become like that. Well, look at Noah. He walked in a wicked world and it was so wicked, the Lord needed to destroy it. And yet he was perfect. He was a just man. He walked with God in the midst of outward surrounding circumstances that were not so good. So we have a choice to make. I love Joshua 24, 15. If it seems evil to you to serve the Lord, choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve, whether the gods your father served which were on the other side of the river. In other words, are you going to follow tradition and serve the God of your parents or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell? That's the peer pressure of the idol worship around them. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Circumstances and environment do not have to control your destiny. We're back to Genesis 6, 11 and 12. The earth also was corrupt before God and the earth was filled with violence. So the Lord looked upon the earth and indeed it was corrupt for all flesh had corrupted their way on the earth. Takeaway number five, trust God and his word, even when you don't understand. You see, the people of Noah's day had never seen a flood. They had never seen rain. And yet Noah was preaching to them and calling to them to make that decision to enter the ark. Faith, it requires risk. Faith means we obey even when we don't always understand. Verse 13, and God said to Noah, the end of all flesh has come before me for the earth is filled with violence through them. And behold, I would destroy them from the face of the earth. Takeaway number six, we don't have time to unpack this, but judgment comes from God and it is still part of love. That's a complicated subject for another time, but love has two sides, the mercy and justice. Finally, verse 14, our last verse, Genesis 6, 14, make yourself an ark of gopher wood, make rooms in the ark and cover it inside and outside with pitch. Final takeaway, number seven, walk in radical obedience when God calls. It had never rained before nor flooded before, but when God said, build an ark, Noah said, yes, Lord, I will do it. Hey, Amen. Yeah, Thank you, Jill, for that great foundation. My name is Shelley Quinn, and I have Monday's lesson, Abram, the father of the faithful. You know, somebody that is listening is probably saying, oh, this is Old Testament. Why is that relevant to us today? Let me tell you something. The Old Testament records 4,000 years of God's interactions with humanity, whereas the New Testament it's barely even a hundred years. It is important. The Old Testament is relevant to us because it shows us what God expects of his people. Abram's story is critical to understand because he is called the father of us all. And who was Abram? Did you know he was a Gentile? Mm -hmm. Gentile simply means nation. And there were no Jews. The, the Jews were not yet a distinct people or ethnic group during Abraham's lifetime. But he was from a pagan country. Now, pagan has to do with religion. And so he came from a polytheistic region, the Ur of Chaldees. But he witnessed idolatry in his own home because his father worshiped more than one God. But Abram, oh, he loved the Lord with all of his heart. God knew it. And he, Abraham followed God. You know, I wonder, where did he get this childlike faith? And I believe it was from Shem, Noah's son, because Shem 
a covenant blessing was pronounced over him and Shem lived 500 years after the flood, the whole time, almost the whole span of Abram's life. So I think maybe his <coughs> relative had told him. So Abram was so loyal to God that Second Chronicles 20 verse 7 says that he was designated as God's faithful friend. He entered into covenant with the Lord, righteousness by faith. It was the expression of the everlasting covenant. We see it in Genesis 3, 15, when God talks about the seed that's going to be born to a woman, a deliverer who will crush the head of the serpent, Satan. But then we see in, um, in, with Abraham, that God ratifies this. And we're going to get to that in just a moment. But here's the point. The everlasting covenant of righteousness by faith introduced in the garden, ratified with Abraham, that's the underpinning for both the Old Testament and the New Testament. The first book that the Apostle Paul wrote was the letter to the Galatians. Listen to what he says, Galatians 3.8. The scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, preached the gospel. It's the same gospel that you and I know. The good news of Jesus Christ, our creator, becoming a man to deliver us. He says, he preached the gospel to Abraham beforehand, saying, and you all the nations of the earth will be blessed. And then going down to Galatians 3, 16, he says, to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. He does not say, and to seeds as of many, but to your seed who is Christ. And then I love Galatians 3.29. If you are Christ, you are Abraham's seed. You are heirs according to the promise. Everything that God promised Abraham was promised through Jesus Christ. We're heirs of the promise. Paul says in Romans 4, 16 and 17, therefore the promise comes by faith so that it may be by grace and may be guaranteed to all of Abraham's offspring, not only to those who are of the law, but to those who are of the faith of Abraham. He is the father of us all. Well, if Abraham's the father of us all, don't you agree that we need to know how God interacted with Abraham. It is written, God, this is continuing in Romans. He said, I've made you a father of many nations. He is our father in the sight of God mm -hmm. in whom he, Abraham, believed. The God who gives life to the dead and calls those things that are not as though they already were. Did you know when God looks at you, 2 Corinthians 5, 17 says, you're a new creation in Christ Jesus. And you may wake up and something happens and that old ugly creation rears its ugly head. And you think, oh, I'm not a new creation. God looks down at you and he knows you are a saint under construction. He knows he's gonna complete the good work he's begun in you. So he calls things that are not as though they already were. He sees you as the new creation. But when we're looking at Abraham, why did God choose Abraham to be the father of us all? Why is he the father of the faithful? Genesis 18, 19 says that God knew Abraham would command his children and his household to keep the way of the Lord, to do righteousness and justice. So God trusted this heart of Abraham. Anytime the Lord of glory called, Abraham obeyed in childlike faith. So when he called him out of the Ur of Chaldees, he first came out with his father, Terah, and Sarah, and Lot. And they got just as far as Haran. And they stopped there. It must have been a God-ordained stop because Abraham always followed the Lord. Well, then we see in Genesis 12, Abraham is 75 now. We don't know how old he was when he left for there. But God repeats his call and Abram just drops everything. And Abram responds to the call. God 
was setting him apart for a divine purpose in the everlasting covenant. And here's what God said to him in Genesis 12. Now the Lord said to Abram, get out of your country, from your family, from your father's house to a land that I will show you. And then he says, I will make you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great. And you shall be a blessing in all, in you, all the families of the earth will be blessed. I will is God's covenant language. That's God's promise. Abram entered into covenant with the Lord. And the, the fact that he says, all the families of the earth will be blessed through you shows that God's plan of salvation spans all ethnic and all geographical boundaries. So Abraham was quick to obey. He knew that obedience was the pathway to God's blessings. Now God promises in Genesis 13, this childless man, his wife, Sarah, had been childless for many years. He promises him that his descendants are going to be like the dust of the earth. And he assures him that he's going to give the promised land. They're wandering. They're living in tents like nomads right now. Genesis 15, he comes along. Now he promises him, still childless, that your descendants are going to be like the stars of the heaven. In my mind, I think possibly the dust of the earth were the biological descendants, the Jews who inherited the physical Canaan, and perhaps the stars were all of the believers who were his spiritual descendants, you and I. But what happens is God knows how consistent Abraham's heart is. And when he is, he ratifies the covenant. He says in Genesis 15, 6, he tells him this and it says, Abraham believed the Lord and he accounted it right. to him. Mm -hmm. He credited, he imputed it to him as righteousness. That's the same thing that you and I, righteousness by faith. So what happens when he is now 99 years old, here's a man made righteous by faith. That's what our pathway is. But when Abram is 99 years old in Genesis 17, 1, the Lord appears to him. And you know what he says? I am the Lord almighty God walk before me and be blameless. What? Now, some people think, oh, you're made righteous by faith. You don't need to worry about obedience. Boy, I'm going to tell you something. You talk about radical obedience. Yes. Abraham obeyed and God expected it. We need to know that. So from the time that he actually left Haran at age 75, did you know it was 25 years before the promised son of the covenant, Isaac, was born? But here's what I love when Paul's, or the writer of Hebrews, we assume it's Paul, he's talking about Abraham and here's what he says. In Hebrews 11, 8 through 10, he says, By faith Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out of the place where he'd receive an inheritance. He went out not knowing where he went. By faith he dwelt in the land of the promise in the foreign land, dwelling in tents with Isaac and Jacob, heirs with him of the same promise. For he waited for the city which had its foundation, whose builder and maker were God. Amen. I love that. Thank you so much, Shelley. What a wonderful lesson. Radical obedience. We see that in Noah's life and in Abraham's life. We're going to take a break. We'll be right back. Ever wish you could watch a 3 Abian Sabbath School panel again? Or share it on Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter? Well, you can by visiting 3 Abian Sabbath School panel.com. A clean design makes it easy to find the program you're looking for. There are also links to the Adult Bible Study Guide so you can follow along. Sharing is easy. Just click share and choose your favorite social media. Share a link. Save a life for eternity. Welcome back to our study on laying up treasure in heaven. We go over to Pastor John Denzi in Tuesday's lesson and somebody who didn't have so much radical obedience. Mm, yes, we're talking about Lot's bad decisions. 
And so uh, first we're going to talk a little bit about Abraham and Lot, and uh, that's where we take off. Let's go ahead and go to Genesis chapter 12, uh, beginning in verse 1. Now the Lord had said to Abram, Get thee out of thy country and from thy kindred and from thy father's house unto a land that I will show thee. And I will make of thee a great nation, and I will bless thee and make thy name great. And thou shalt be a blessing. And I will bless them that bless thee and curse him that curseth thee. And in thee shall all the families of the earth be blessed. So Abram departed as the Lord had spoken unto him. And notice, and Lot went with him. And Abram was 75 years old when he departed out of Haran. And so I say to you, that even though uh, we see the Bible records a, a, a Lot made some bad decisions, this was a good one. He mm -hmm. went That's with right. Abram. Uh, we move now to Genesis chapter 12, where we see that uh, Abram continues his journey as the Lord is guiding him. And in Genesis chapter 12, verse 10, it says, Now there was a famine in the land. By this time, um, he was, Abram was by Bethel, and so Lot was bit, uh, with him. They were by a mountain. It says uh, that they continued journeying, uh, going towards the south. And now there's a famine in the land, it says verse 10. And Abram went down to Egypt to dwell there, for the famine was severe in the land. And you know uh, the story where Abram uh, decides that, well, my wife is beautiful. Now she, remember, he left the house when he was 75 years old. His wife was about 65. She was still beautiful enough for him to say a lie. That's my sister. That's my sister. But notice here that uh, uh, now chapter 13, beginning in verse 1, Then Abram went up from Egypt, he and his wife, and all that he had, and Lot went with him to the south. Again, Lot makes a good decision. Abram was very rich in livestock and in silver and in gold, and he went on his journey from the south as far as Bethel to the place where his tent had been at the beginning between Bethel and Ai, to the place of the altar which he had made at there, there at first. And there Abram called on the name of the Lord. And so as uh, Abram did, so did Lot. Uh, now, as we go to Genesis 13, 5 through 7, this is where you see a departure uh, that begins with Abraham and Lot. Lot also, uh, it, I'm reading now Genesis 13, beginning in verse 5. Lot also who went with Abram had flocks and herds and tents. Now the land was not able to support them that they might dwell together for their possessions were so great that they could not dwell together. The Lord had blessed them. Uh, blessed Abram, blessed Lot as well. And there was a strife between the herdsmen of Abram's, Abram's livestock and the herdsmen of Lot's, uh, Lot's livestock. The Canaanites and the Parasites uh, then dwelt in the land. So this takes us to Genesis 13, 8. So Abram said to Lot, Please, let there be no strife between you and me and between my herdsmen and your herdsmen, for we are brethren. Is it not, it's not the whole land before you? Please separate from me. If you take the left, then I will go to the right. Or if you go to the right, then I will go to the left. Now here is where Lot has to make a decision. And uh, this is one of those things where you have to ask yourself, did he do what Proverbs chapter 3, verse 5, 6? Mm -hmm. uh, verse, uh, Proverbs chapter 3, verse 5 and 6 says that he acknowledged the Lord and asked the Lord to direct his path and you know the story is that he did not, apparently. Notice what happens, Genesis 13, verse 10. And Lot lifted his eyes and saw all the plain of Jordan, that it was well watered everywhere before the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah, like the garden of the Lord, like the land of Egypt as you go toward Zoar. So we see he looks at this and he says, wow, this is like the garden of Eden, like I heard, that's where I'm going. It was a selfish yeah. motivation. Then Lot chose for himself all the plain of Jordan, and Lot journeyed east, and they separated from each other. Abram dwelt in the land of Canaan, and Lot dwelt in the cities of the plain, and notice, and pitched his tent even as far as Sodom. And this is when trouble begins for Lot and his family. This is when... And uh, now his family is exposed to things they had never seen before. 
or if they had seen it, they completely ignored it because uh, Abraham and Lot were together. And this was a, a, a place where they were able to encourage one another. Now, Lot has to be the, the head of the family and preserve the knowledge of God. Yeah. Unfortunately, we see that his daughters went to Sodom and married, intermarried with the people of Sodom. And this is why we have the terrible situation that takes place for Lot and his family. Uh, we do have a scripture in 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 6, that apparently Lot still longed to have a relationship with the Lord. <laughs> Notice uh, 2 Peter chapter 2, beginning in verse 6, and turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, condemned them with an overthrow, making them an example unto those that after should live ungodly and delivered, notice how the Bible describes him, and delivered just Lot, vexed with the filthy conversation of the wicked. So even the conversation of the people of Sodom was wicked. Not only their actions, but their uh, conversations were wicked. And notice how uh, verse 8 describes him. For that righteous man, talking about Lot, dwelling among them in seeing and hearing vexed his righteous soul from day to day with their unlawful deeds. So here we have a question for why would he stay there seeing and hearing all of that, uh, all that corrupting influence? It could be, I believe, that his daughters had married and they did not want to move away. They took deep roots in the area. And remember, he was rich increased with goods, gold, silver. But when he left Sodom and Gomorrah, he left with nothing. Mm. The decisions of life will either be for your good or for your evil. And I'm, uh, I'm dwelling on this because there may be some listening right now that uh, have either made or are about to make a decision like Lot. They see some place that appears to be well watered, a place where you can get rich, a place where you can gain more. And uh, you're looking at that place as a, a place of temporal gain. But you have to weigh all these things in the balances. What will it do for my relationship with the Lord? What will it do for the relationship uh, of, for my family with the Lord? And this is what Lot did not apparently take into consideration. Saw the place watered and wonderful place to uh, really thrive. Right. But it was a seriously uh, bad decision. Mm. Notice, uh, here's the lesson brings out. However easily Lot could have justified his decision to move to the city, things didn't turn out so great for him. And uh, it brings out that at the time came when Abraham had to come to the rescue of uh, Lot and his family because they were taken captive. And you know, perhaps this is one of those wake up calls. And still Lot went back to Sodom mm. and Gomorrah and lived among those wicked people. Remember the conversation, the things they were seeing and hearing, he vexed his righteous soul day to day. And if you are having that experience, your, your righteous soul is being vexed by the things you see and hear. If, this, if that's in your house, if it's coming through the TV and you're not watching 3ABN, you need, you need to turn to 3ABN, stay on 3ABN. If you're just watching 3ABN, I think I'll watch 3ABN on Friday night and Saturday. And the rest of the week, I'm walking the wicked, watching the wicked conversations and the things of the world. Beware, you may be bringing influence into your home that uh, could harm you and your family. I like to read this from... Uh, testimony, volume 4, page 110. Uh, and then uh, let's read that first. The dwellers in Sodom were corrupt. Vile conversation greeted his ears daily, and his righteous soul was vexed by the violence and crime he was powerless to prevent. His children were becoming like these wicked people, for association with them had perverted their morals. Ta uh, taking all these things into consideration, the worldly riches he had gained seemed small and not worth the price he had paid for them. His family connections were ex extensive. His children have been married among the Sodomites. And uh, this decision led to the horrible, 
horrible loss that he incurred. And I encourage you, if you're seeing these similar things, go to the Lord. You may need to leave where you are. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Thank you, Johnny. Appreciate that. Wednesday, from deceiver to prince. Let me just make the statement at the very outset. God's dream for your life may be delayed, but God is so determined it will not be denied. Mm -hmm. God had a vision for this young man from the time he was born. And lives may be filled with bad decisions, but Jeremiah 29, 11, when God says, I know the plans I have for you, part of his story is just like my story, maybe like many of our stories. God's dreams may be delayed, but God's grace is so great, it, those dreams are not denied. You know, Jacob was a deceiver. His very name meant that. And you know the story very well, how he conspired with his mother to steal the birthright of his older brother. Yeah. And even putting skin on his arm, you know, hairy arms, to make his father think that it was the other brother that was receiving the birthright rather than he. And then we, we read how this conspiracy continued to, you know, when you do one thing that's wrong, it just... You cannot correct a wrong. You just exacerbate it. And trying to cover up one bad decision with another bad decision is like sweeping dirt under a rug. After a while, it's going to start pushing up and people will know what they see is a cumulative effect, not something done at one particular time. In Genesis chapter 27, verses 43 to 45, we find the questions there are, the story really reveals the conspiracy between the mother and son. Now, therefore, my son, obey my voice. Arise, flee to my brother Laban and Haran, and stay with him a few days until your brother's fury turns away, until your brother's anger turns away from you, and he forgets what you have done to him. Then I will send and bring you from there. Why should you be bereaved also of you? Why should I be bereaved of you both in one day? Now, this is crazy. I'm reading this statement, and I'm not believing that she's saying this. Wait there until your brother forgets what you did to him. <laughs> How many of us forget what people do to us? This was not a matter of Esau forgetting. This was a matter of Esau relenting because Esau pursued his brother determinedly. You know the story of Jacob's ladder. All of these are part of the evidences that even though Jacob was a deceiver, God was still with him. And this, this whole conspiracy to go away and stay away long enough and when the time comes, I'll call for you. When you read the story, Jacob never saw his mother again. Yeah. 20 years had gone by and he never saw his mother's face again. So this is where conspiracy never pays. When you conspire together to do a wrong, time may pass, but that conspiracy never becomes a right deed. And Jacob surely missed his mom. I did a story many years ago, matter of fact, a sermon called From Pits to Palaces. Mm -hmm. And the moment I got this page, Shelley, I want to tell you, that whole thing came back to me. Some of the points that I made out there was, um, here was a, our greatest trial is introduced through God's greatest dreams. Our greatest trial will prepare us for God's greatest dream. The brightest morning only rises on those who endure the darkest nights. And there were some dark nights in the life of Jacob. I mean, I believe that one of the reasons why he went through and endured some of the things he did was because of his bad decisions. Let's go to Genesis chapter 32 and look together at verses 22 down to verse 31. And after we read that, we have to ask the question, what happened here to Jacob? And what spiritual lesson can we draw from this? Here it is. And it says, and he arose that night, Genesis 32, 32. verses 22 to 31. Okay. I speak fast sometimes. I hit, hit my New York stride. Here we are, Genesis chapter 32, verses 22 to 31. And he arose that night and took his two wives, his two female servants, and his 11 sons, and crossed over the ford of Jabbok. He took them, sent them over the brook, and sent over what he had. Then Jacob was left alone, and a man wrestled with him until the breaking of day. Now when he saw that he did not prevail against him, 
he touched the socket of his hip and the socket of Jacob's hip was out of joint as he wrestled with him. And he said, let me go for the day breaks. But he said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. I got to make a point here that's really in the back of my mind. Some of us let go just short of the blessing. Mm. If you would just hold on and wrestle with God a little longer. Mm -hmm. Some of us are wrestling with issues in our lives right now. Hold on and say as he did, I will not let you go until you bless me. We, We let go just shy of the blessing hold on and wrestle with God, wrestle with God for your marriage, Mm -hmm. wrestle with God for your children, wrestle with God for your spiritual walk. You know, it's better to wrestle with God and get the blessing that will come if you do not give up, if you do not relent, wrestle with God and the blessing will come. But some of us want to avoid the wrestling. Mm. (laughs) The wrestling has to happen for the blessing to come. So if if the Lord comes into the darkness of your night, and allows you to embrace him. He's there not for you to defeat him, but for him to bless you. Mm -hmm. It's going to come in the moments of wrestling. Let's continue the story because I have four points that goes along with this. We now start, go in verse um, verse, uh, 26. And he said, let me go for the day breaks. But he said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. So we said to him, what is your name? Did the, the, did the Lord know that? Oh, yeah. He knew the answer. He said, Jacob. And he said, your name shall no longer be called a deceiver, mm. <laughs> but Israel, for you have struggled with God and with men and have prevailed. That's where the word Israel means overcomer. Jacob, deceiver, Israel, overcomer. You shall, because you have prevailed. Then Jacob asked in verse 29, tell me your name, I pray. And he said, Why is that you ask about my name? Why is it that you ask about my name? And he blessed him there. So Jacob called the name of the place Peniel, for I have seen God face to face and my life is preserved. Just as he crossed over Peniel, the sun rose on him and he limped on his hip. Now, this is a very interesting parallel here. It's better to limp into righteousness than to walk into wickedness. Mm. It's better to limp and live righteously than be in great shape and live a wicked life. This is a, the result of his wickedness was a reminder uh, in his limp. You know, that's why the Lord says it's better to enter into heaven with one eye than to hell with two or with one arm and into hell with two. The limp of this life is worth the joy that comes hereafter. And it's a statement that was made here in, in, uh, Patriots and prophets, I will choose not to read it. If time prevails, I'll go back to it. But let me bring out a couple of points here because we find later on the life that he lived left him with pretty much not very much, but a, but a, but a request was made to, about his final resting place. And with the meager sum of what he had left, the question is, who else was buried where Jacob requested to be buried. We find the answer in Genesis chapter 49. And uh, let's look at verse 31. There they buried Abraham and Sarah, his wife. There they buried Isaac and Rebekah, his wife. And there I buried Leah. The field and the cave that is there was purchased from his son Heth. And when Jacob had finished commanding his sons, he drew his feet up into the bed and breathed his last and was gathered to his people. In the closing moments of his life, in spite of all of the deception of his past, in spite of the limited blessings, he, his request was still promised. Four quick takeaways in a minute and two seconds. Your present decision will impact your future options. Your present decision will impact your future options. Hosea 8 verse 7, they sow the wind and they reap the whirlwind. Once again, your present decisions are the seeds of your future product. Whatever a man sows, that shall he also reap. Galatians 6 and verse 7. And when you are blessed, you will be blessed. 2 Corinthians 9 verse 6. He who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. God blesses us not because of us. God blesses us in spite of us. 
And finally, liberality begets liberality. Luke 6 and verse 38, give and it will be given to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together and running over will be put into your bosom. For with the same measure that you use, it will be measured back to you. When we get to heaven, I'm looking forward to meeting the man that may be limping. Mm. <laughs> That's good. Amen. Thank you, Pastor. Thank you guys so much for the powerful lessons. I have Thursday's lesson. My name is Ryan Day and I am studying. We're going to study together Moses in Egypt. Um, and the lesson brings out that the character of Moses dominated the early years of sacred history. Uh, he was kept alive in the providence of God who worked through an enterprising mother and a caring sister. And of course, when Pharaoh's daughter found baby Moses in the Ark of Bulrushes, she asked his Hebrew mother to care for him and paid her to do so. Uh, and of course, the lesson brings out that it's what a blessed challenge this was for a young mother who was an exile and slave. Uh, Jacobed, I guess I'm saying that, Jacobed, Jacobed, however you yeah. say her name, uh, only had 12 years to teach her child to pray and of course to trust and honor God and shape his character for a life of service. And of course, for years, Moses was trained in the royal courts of Egypt. And this brings, brings out this in Acts chapter 7, verses 20 through 22. And if you read those texts, it says, at this time, Moses was born and was well pleasing to God and he was brought he he was brought up in his father's house for three months. But when he was set out, Pharaoh's daughter took him away and brought him up as her own. And Moses was learned in all the wisdom of the Egyptians and was mighty in the words and deeds. This is just a little bit of a background, of course, uh, of Moses' life early on being raised up as a young man in Egypt. And uh, I mean, my goodness, you talk about a, uh, in this situation, rags to riches. I mean, literally the brother went from a slave family to, you know, the upper courts of, of, of Egypt. Um, but the lesson as asking the question, but ultimately Moses was confronted with a reality that he had to address because of course he became known of, of his history, who his people were, and was he going to continue in the path of the Egyptians? Would he, would he continue in down that path of technically unrighteousness and pagan culture or would he eventually be brought to the decision of living among his people and, and basically uh, being brought in harmony with the same reality that his people were having. And of course, the Bible brings this out very clearly of what Moses ultimately left behind. Hebrews chapter 11, that great faith chapter, uh, verses 23 through 29. Let's go there. Hebrews chapter 11, verses 23 to 29. And it gives us a clear indication as to what Moses left behind and what decision he ultimately made. Verse 23 of Hebrews 11 says, By faith Moses, when he was born, was hidden three months by his parents because, he, because they saw he was a beautiful child and they were not afraid of the king's command. By faith Moses, when he became of age, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the passing pleasures of sin, esteeming the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures in Egypt, for he looked to the reward. Verse 27, by faith he forsook Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king, for he endured as seeing him who is invisible. By faith he kept the Passover and the sprinkling of blood, lest he who destroyed the firstborn should touch them. And then verse 29, by faith they passed through the Red Sea as by dry land, whereas the Egyptians attempted to do so were <laughs> drowned. So that's a real quick kind of juiced version of what decision ultimately Moses decided to make. He <laughs> wanted to uh, relate and to be joined in with his people because he was not going to take on the path of, of unrighteousness, the path of paganism, the path <laughs> of a polytheistic culture of worshiping many false gods when he could worship the one true God. And you want to really break down what Moses ultimately gave up. You want to talk about a man of faith and what he really was confronted with. When you consider the life he had in Egypt and what was set up for him as not just, just any ordinary man, this brother was would have eventually probably became maybe even a Pharaoh, but for sure the second highest man in Egypt. Egypt was most likely during Moses' time the greatest superpower in the known world at the time. And of course, the abundance of wealth 
was immeasurable in comparison to other nations. Treasures and resources unlike any other nation at that time. And of course, the Nile River, which flowed right through Egypt, nourished uh, perhaps the most lush and fertile land, which made Egypt champions of agriculture, which boosted their already booming economy. So this brother was set, right? He set in a very, very rich environment, a very rich nation, vast and advanced architecture and beauty. Egypt had one of the most advanced and powerful militaries at the time. And of course, again, contrary to Christian principle and, 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 and in, in the, the biblical truth, pharaohs and Egyptian governors uh, were known to have many wives and concubines. And then of course, uh, the last note I read here is they had the, some of the most advanced and educated scientists and sciences in the world. So Egypt was, was a very, very uh, advanced uh, uh, region, a very advanced uh, culture during that time. And that's what Moses was giving up. And what was he giving it up for? You just read the scripture, <laughs> read the story of scripture. It's like, whoa, many of us would look at it and go, yeah, I think I'll take Egypt. I'm, I'm not I'm going to take the easy way. I'm not going to take this, this hard way. We're talking about eventually having to be exiled from his family and, the, and this people, the culture that he grew up in because of a bad decision he made. He goes into the wilderness in exile for many years, but eventually comes back and now has to endure 10 devastating plagues. Uh, e Egyptian armies attempting to wipe out him and his people, the Israelites, uh, uh, to, went through some literal bitter water experiences, but also a lack of water, uh, it also a lack of food for the Israelites in, in a couple of occasions, complaining and grumbling by the Israelites, refusing to heed to instruction as God called them stubborn and stiff necked. These are the people he was dealing with. A lack of faith from the people ended up right there at Mount Sinai, God giving him, the, establishing the covenant, giving them the Ten Commandments. And before Moses could even return back down from the mountain, there the people are worshiping the golden calf, breaking God's commandments. He had to deal with warring tribes in the deserts like the Midianites and the Malachites, settling disputes all the time among his people, traveling in hostile and harsh climate conditions, rebellion and opposition from his own family. And of course, he also had, had to endure a, a horrible, dreadful invasion of deadly snakes. Uh, 40 years, okay, 40 years wandering in a dry, desolate desert. And of course, at the end of it all, refused entry into the promised land. I mean, this brother gave up a lot. And, and again, we're not uplifting the man. We uplift the God in the man. But at the end of the day, Moses had to make a decision. He weighed in the balances. He could see what it possibly was that he was going to have to endure. And he decided to, uh, to suffer with his people and to, and to relate to his people and to walk in the way and in the righteousness of God. You know, we are also the same. We have sometimes the same decisions that we must make also. Are we going to walk down the broad path of destruction? It may be smooth now. It may be calm now. It may be very nice and, and, and pleasant now, uh, uh, but it leads to destruction. Or are we going to take that path that may have some bumps in the roads, may have some challenges, may have some difficulties and some trials and tribulations along the way, but ultimately it leads to life. We also must make the decision. Are we going to walk in the ways of the Lord or are we going to relate and also endure the sufferings also that Christ must have and could have and also went through? First Peter chapter four, verses 12 through 16 and verse 19 highlights this, that it should be, we should consider it an honor to be able to suffer as Christ suffered. It says, beloved, do not think it strange concerning the fiery trial, which is to, is to try you as though some strange thing happened to you, but rejoice to the extent that you partake of Christ's sufferings, that when his glory is revealed, you also, or excuse me, you may also be glad with exceeding joy for the spirit of glory of God rests upon you. Of their part he is blasphemed, but on your part he is glorified. But let none of you suffer as murder, a thief, an evildoer, or as a busybody in other people's matters. Yet if anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed. Moses wasn't ashamed. He suffered with his people, but he knew there was a promised end, a, a, a blessed end to it all. So let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God in this matter. And of course, verse 19, therefore, let those who suffer according to the will of God commit their souls to him in doing good as to a faithful creator. Mm -hmm. But at the end of the day, if we're going to partake also in those trials that Christ went through and to count it all joy, 
to be to suffer as Christ suffered, we also have to have the proper mindset. Moses had the mind of his God. We must have the mind of Christ, that mind which was also in Christ Jesus. And of course, 1 John chapter 2, verses 15 through 17 highlights for us and reminds us of what ultimate decision we have today. And that is, do not love the world or the things of the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. And this world, <laughs> it's passing away and the lust of it. But he who does the will of God abides forever. Moses was a mighty man of God. Yes, Moses once lived and dwelt in Egypt. He once was an Egyptian, but he ultimately decided to become that blessed seed of Abraham. Amen. Thank you so much, Brother Ryan, Pastor John, Brother Johnny, and Shelley. What an incredible study. I want to give each one of you a moment to share a final thought. Thinking about radical obedience, uh, Mos Moses, Abraham was the father of us all, is the father of us all. Genesis 26, 5 says that Abraham, this is God speaking, kept, obeyed my voice, kept my charge, my commandments, my statutes, and my laws. Abraham knew that God was his shield and exceedingly great reward. He gave up everything to follow him because he looked for the city that's coming. Thank you so much. When we consider Lot and the decisions he made, these things are set for us for an example to, so that we can avoid unnecessary suffering in this world. With Christ involved, the, the discomfort of your present will yield to the blessings of your future. Be patient and wrestle with God. Amen. Amen. I just want to reiterate the text I read earlier, 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 19. Therefore, let those who suffer according to the will of God commit their souls to Him in doing good as to a faithful Creator. Amen. This week we've been looking up laying up treasure in heaven. I want to leave you with Romans 15, verse 4. It says, whatever things were written before were written for our learning that we through patience and comfort of the scriptures might have hope. These men of God, these Old Testament heroes of faith, as we see their sometimes mistakes and their decisions to follow God can inspire us today that we need to make that choice in radical obedience and to lay up treasure in heaven. I invite you to join us next week, lesson number seven, unto the least of these.